I'm Brandon Stanglin, and this is One Mind Brainwaves. Welcome. Today's topic, one of the most common neurodevelopmental disorders is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. Usually first diagnosed in childhood, it can last well into adulthood and even last an entire lifetime. Marked by inattention, overactivity, and impulsivity, behaviors that everyone experiences at some time in their life or another. In ADHD, these experiences uh, can form obstacles for people's everyday life. But as with other types of neurodiversity, we find that uh, ADHD can also be a benefit in addition to a liability uh, for people who live with it. And later in the show, we'll be talking with someone who credits his ADHD for being a positive influence on his creativity, his life, and his career. Chef, famed chef, award-winning restaurateur, and author, John Bennell. He will join us later in the show. And stick around. At the end of the show, we'll have our wonderful Cyber Guide team, One Mind Cyber Guide team, with our mental health app pick of the week. But first, here now to discuss the emerging neuroscience research and innovation surrounding ADHD is Dr. Adam Ghazali. He's a professor in neurology, physiology, and psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. He's also the founder and director of the Neuroscape Lab at UCSF. It's a neuroscience center engaged in scientific research and technology creation. Adam, welcome to Brainwaves. Thanks for having me here, Brandon. Good seeing you. Good to see you too. Uh, it's been great to see you over so many years and great to see you right now. So on we go. Um, viewers, we want to know what you think too. If you have any questions for Adam or uh, for um, One Mind during the webcast today, please drop them in the chat at any time. And if you know anyone can benefit from the information we're sharing today, please share this webcast with them. Adam, First off, most people have heard of ADHD or know what it is. Um, maybe they've experienced it or their family member has, but um, they may not understand the causes. What do we know about the causes of ADHD uh, to date? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, ADHD is, is a very complex condition. It's been around for a long time, even before it had the name ADHD. And it's, it's complicated, not the least of which, because many of us experience problems with attention. I mean, who, who doesn't to some degree? And so it, it, is, um, it is a challenge oftentimes to think of it as a disease, a condition separate from all the variations in attention that occur um, from day to day and between different individuals. Um, and there has been thousands of participants in research studies um, over the years. Um, in terms of causes, uh, I actually want to point your listeners out to a recent paper that will share information on that and, and a whole uh, lot more about ADHD. It is the World Federation of ADHD International Consensus Statement, and it just came out in 2021. So we'll, we'll share a link to that. Uh, uh, but it's a treasure trove of information on ADHD, more, you know, hundreds of statements that were compiled by the dozen, over dozen authors on the study. Uh, so it's, it's worth reading and it will answer pretty much everything you have uh, ever wanted to know about ADHD. In terms of causes, their statement is that it's rarely, rarely caused by a single genetic or environmental factor. Um, but likely caused by a com combination of these, um, each of them having a very small role. This is why it's so complicated, because it's not just like this leads to that. They're multifactorial, as many other conditions of the mind are. Um, one factor that I want to discuss a little bit, because it's relevant to the discussion, the larger discussion that we're, we're going to have here about technology, is the role of digital media and technology in ADHD. There is some evidence for this from studies over the years. Uh, there was another really great paper that just came out in 2020 called Brain Health Consequences of Digital Technology Use. It's a balanced article talking about both the negative and positive effects, but they allude to a paper that I found very interesting um, that uh, um, assessed the relationship between digital media, media use and ADHD symptoms. And their conclusion was, it was a longitudinal study of adolescents 15 to 16 years old. And what it found was that there was a significant association between higher modern digital media use and subsequent symptoms of ADHD two years later. These are people that didn't start with ADHD symptoms. So 
there's something there, uh, but what's important to note with a lot of these studies is that this is correlational data. It's an association. It may not be causal. So it's possible that people that are more, than adolescents that are more uh, disposed to use digital media may have um, other causes that are leading them to have ADHD, and that's why they're using media in that way. But it's at least worth noting that that relationship does exist. That is fascinating. That reminds me of uh, some research I did a few years ago on music and mental health and thinking that maybe listening to certain types of maybe depressing music might make you depressed. But uh, mm -hmm. the research I found then was more like the, um, uh, the kind of music you listen to may indicate your frame of mind, uh, but not necessarily cause a frame of mind on a chronic basis. Um, mm -hmm. But it's similar, similar kind of a thing. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that fascinating sure. information. Um, so you know, more and more technology is actually being used to create digital therapies uh, for people who experience ADHD and other brain health conditions. Uh, and you've been a leader in that research and development. What role can technology play in attention improvement? Yeah, so that is a, a topic uh, near and dear to my heart. I've been working on this, this exact topic for 12 years now. And it started with um, an idea that I had of building a video game uh, that was not designed to decrease attention as many people feel it does, but to improve attention. And the conceptual basis for that project, the hypothesis is that our brains are plastic, this is well known, meaning that they have this ability to modify every single level from the structure, the function, the neurochemistry, all in response to experience. It's the entire basis of learning and it exists throughout our life. It just doesn't end after you go through developmental stages as, as we once thought. So the idea is that if experience can lead to change um, in your brain and your brain function, can we design experiences that are very personalized and fun and engaging so that people want to do them and can be delivered through modern technology so that they could wind up right in your home. Uh, that was the concept. Uh, and so we built a video game called NeuroRacer at UCSF in my lab at the time, which is now a research center, as you mentioned, Neuroscape. And that game, NeuroRacer, uh, we showed, improved the ability of older adults to pay attention on very different tasks and their, and their working memory, their ability to remember faces for short periods of time. And now a very long story short, uh, that technology led to a company that I helped co-found called Achille Interactive that has created a video game um, that uh, the same built on the same technology, the same underlying engine as NeuroRacer. This game's called Endeavor RX. And now multiple trials have shown that it can improve attention, including in children that have ADHD. That is amazing. Wow. Turning it on its head, using technology for, <laughs> uh, for good rather than evil, <laughs> which That's is what it goal. should be used for. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Double-edged sword used for good. Awesome. Um, and uh, you know, let's talk a little bit more about that. How did the interactive media you've designed at Neuroscape, including the first FDA approved video game for treatment of ADHD, uh, help to improve cognitive abilities? How did they do that? And what, what does the research say? What do the studies involve? And how is the efficacy measured? It's a great question. So the exciting conclusion and only the temporary conclusion, because there's a lot more in front of us, but was that after 12 years from idea to prototype game research study at UCSF, uh, our nature paper in 2013 on older adults, Achille formed as a company, multiple clinical trials, that um, a, a study led by Scott Collins out of Duke, I'll talk about the studies a little bit, was submitted to the FDA and right in the middle of last year, in the heart of the COVID pandemic, we uh, uh, obtained FDA approval for that game as a medical device to treat uh, inattention in children uh, with ADHD. Um, really exciting um, because there is really been, um, you know, a focus, almost a complete focus on using stimulants as, as medication. And here we open the, uh, you know, what we think about medicine and show that a digitally delivered experience can reach the same high bar to get FDA uh, clearance and, uh, and be used therapeutically. And that makes it the first ever video game approved by the FDA for any medical condition and the first digital uh, treatment for children. So really excited. I mean, hundreds of people involved from Neuroscape to Achille and also obviously the hundreds of, of 
patients and participants that uh, uh, were, were in those studies. So that's, that's really exciting, um, you know, uh, result of uh, over a decade of work. Um, there's another, you know, giant mountain to climb, which is now getting that into the, the hands of children in need of a treatment like this. And uh, that's sort of, a, you know, Achilles challenge right now. We're really excited that that's begun. Uh, you asked questions about the research. So I'll give you a little bit more details there. Uh, you know, the, the technology started at, in my laboratory at UCSF, but then as, as you hope happens, as every scientist hope happens, is that other scientists take it and validate it and do the work. And that's what happened. I was actually not even an author on the studies I'm gonna mention uh, that as, as I said, was, was led by Scott Collins from Duke. And the, the study that was submitted to the FDA, the, the pivotal study uh, was in children eight to 12 years old with uh, a diagnosis of ADHD. And it was a multi-site study, 20 sites, almost three, 350 children uh, with the diagnosis. And it was a double blind placebo controlled trial. So just from a methodology point of view to do that type of study that was really designed off of the pharmaceutical studies with a video game is already um, a milestone. And that study uh, showed uh, the primary outcome there was a diagnostic test that's used uh, for ADHD. Um, it's called the TOVA. It's a sustained attention test. It's really, really boring uh, by design. Uh, that's where uh, children with ADHD suffer most in those environments that are not stimulating. And so how we design our studies, both at Neuroscape and, and Achille and, and others and Scott's studies, uh, Scott Collins studies is that we use different um, tests before and after, not the video game itself, the video game treatment to look for transfer benefits. So you play this game, rich, rewarding environment. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll show you a, a video of that as well. Um, and then we test you in this really boring uh, task that's designed to see if playing the game could lead to an ability of you to direct your attention in a very boring context. Unfortunately, how many children view school sometimes and reading. Uh, so that's really the goal is to not just get better at the game, but show that benefit outside of the game in a task uh, that's important to what, how we engage in the real world. And that primary outcome was shown to improve significantly in with, with Achilles game and Devorex and not in, a, in another game, a word game that was used as essentially a placebo that had sort of the same expectations of benefit. Um, and then there's also shown significant improvements in both uh, parents and um, uh, doctor uh, impressions of ADHD symptoms. Um, in, in another paper uh, that, that we'll share with your listeners um, more recently, they showed that that benefit occurred independently of whether the child was taking medication, stimulant medication. So, so it's there equivalently in both groups and a little bit of a look at sustainability. So there was a one month treatment followed by a one month pause where there was no degradation and then additional improvement with, with another month of treatment. So, you know, there's a lot to be done. These are still the early findings. Uh, they were convincing enough to move it through the FDA and now get it into patients' hands, uh, but a lot more work to be done, both on developing new games and treating different conditions. That is fascinating to think that um, we could treat a, a mental health condition using a game, something that people want to use, and it's actually fun, and the studies are showing that it actually works. Congratulations on those results. It's a fruition of your, of your vision. Um, are there side effects that you've tracked from the game? And are there any, any uh, concerns about side effects? And what do you do about those? There are definitely concerns about side effects because um, anything that cuts one way could cut the other way, right? Um, it's, it's just the nature of, of nature, right? That there is going to be positives and negatives. And you can't be so bold as to claim that a video game could have positive benefits with not, without also entertaining the, the option that they could have negative effects. So we take that seriously. So does the FDA. So you build in 
all of those aspects to your experiments. And we do that with all of our experiments. So we see no serious side effects um, in any of the studies that we've done with this game or other games. But there are minor side effects. The most common is frustration. Uh, so I, I don't think it's quite up there with the side effects that you see with other uh, medications. but. The game is hard, you know, it's pushing your your abilities uh, to the next level and it's frustrating, um, you know, other, you know, some headaches and other minor things. But for the most part, I think it's remarkably safe, which is important. Um, and we're really excited about that. But, you know, we'll continue to monitor if there's any unintended consequences. I guess on that note, one thing that's worth mentioning is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the concern that um, people have with video games is that they're addictive or at least, you know, can are susceptible to overuse because they're fun and they're engaging. They're designed to pull you in and capture your your emotions and your attention. And so that's that's a real thing. Um, you know, we have brilliant game designers on our team that uh, know how to build and create um, experiences that are captivating, that you want to play for a long time, that you want to keep coming back to play. And that's important, right? Because we know that compliance with medication is normally really very low, even for life-saving medications that are as easy to take as just putting a pill in your mouth. This actually takes work and effort you know, on a daily basis. And so how we manage that is that built into the programming, you can't overdose on this this medication. So you can only play for 30 minutes a day. You can only play for five days a week. And a dosage is, is a one month uh, supply. And, and then, <laughs> you know, you could have another month. So this is the beauty of a digitally delivered medicine and experiential medicine in this way, in that we could control the dosage, know if it's being taken and prevent it from being taken too much. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the really um, interesting opportunity of using software in this way. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It, it, it takes advantage of the fact that the game is so much fun that people, the kids want to use it, they want to play it and get the benefit from it, right? And so it prevents, it gives them just the benefit that they need and then leaves it at that. Yep. Fantastic. Awesome. Wow. Um, in addition, and so let, let's see, take a look at this game now, uh, Project Evo. Let's show this little video of it. Introducing Endeavor RX. Discover new worlds. That's what I'm talking about. Build your universe. Capture mystic creatures. Hey, 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 whoa. Boost past challenges. Bam. And unlock new characters. Are you ready to start exploring? Awesome. Introducing Endeavor RX. Adam, what a what an amazing looking game! I, I'd love to play that sometime. It does look incredibly fun. Thank you. In addition to being a neuroscientist, inventor, author, photographer, and entrepreneur, you're a prolific communicator of science on podcasts such as our webcast today, uh, television, radio, and at conferences all over the world. What drives your passion in this way? Have you always um, felt that it was your mission to share your fascinating perspectives on the brain? Well, I wouldn't say always, but for the last 15 years, it's been a big part of my life. And for me, it was it really just started with giving those first public talks and um, standing in front of audiences and talking about the brain and seeing how interested and excited they got. And it was really gratifying to me. Um, and I also believe it is it, a mission of science that it should be communicated, not just in peer reviewed publication, but translated and made understandable to non-scientists. I think it is part of the mission. And so for me, it's been a journey of learning how to communicate complicated topics in a way that's digestible and, and engaging. And it's been an education. I've learned a lot uh, by communicating to the public. Uh, it's, it's clarified my thinking. It lets me see what's important to people. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and I intend to continue. That's wonderful. It's great to have a career where you're continuously learning new things that benefit you as well as other people. Fantastic. Thanks. And then uh, you also co-authored, uh, the distracted mind before you go, can you give us some quick tips on how people can reduce distraction in their lives and improve their, their mental focus? Sure. So The Distracted Mind um, has a subtitle, Ancient Brains in a High-Tech World. And it's really an evolutionary perspective on 
what our brains do, what they're good at, what they're not good at, and then how modern technology collides with that. Um, so a lot of the challenges that technology has faced, and, and in addition to discussions about the promise that we've been largely talking about today. Uh, so one, you know, we hope that we will flip the story around, as you alluded to, use technology to create good, to enhance what makes us human and, and not degrade us. And stay tuned, right? We, we already have this one FDA approved product. FDA is not the only pathway that we will move our technologies into the world. And so we believe, and I, and I do believe strongly that we will show that technologies can be good for your attention and your memory. We're working on things that, uh, you know, deal with stress regulation, even empathy and compassion are in our sights right now. So that is coming. And there's a lot of great groups around the world working on that. But in the meanwhile, uh, you know, there's a, a lot that you can do in your daily lives to help diminish distraction and obtain better focus. And the first that I would say is just awareness of how vulnerable we are to being distracted um, and paying attention, having like this meta awareness of, of your challenges that you face in, in holding attention to a single task or even engaging in a conversation with someone you care about without being pulled into your devices. So I always say it starts with awareness and, and just paying attention to your behaviors. And, uh, you know, that's not enough to change completely, but it's enough to begin. And I think it's really important to you know, really monitor how you act. I mean, do you have difficulty at, you know, online at a supermarket, not looking at your device, even though you might only have to wait a minute or even at a red light? Um, you know, these are tells that maybe the uh, allure is a little too strong and can be um, sort of uh, controlled. And so being aware and then taking control over how you use technology, making decisions. It, these, these technologies and, um, you know, whether it's social media or internet use in general, uh, video games, they're, they're really designed well by very smart people to pull your attention to them and away from other things. So helping build habits, healthier habits about how you engage in technology is what I try to do in my life. So practice doing one thing at a time. It takes time because you get used to just jumping from, from one task to another, but this is a skill like anything else that you can get better at. Um, realize that breaks are important and that all breaks are not created equal. So a break is not necessarily going on social media or do, going on your emails. Those just take you into another, you know, uh, iterative cycle of distraction. Um, you know, rather um, exposure to nature, meditation, light, physical fitness, even walking um, are better activities that you could use for breaks and then dive back into your to your main task. So those are some advice that I only give because I try to follow them myself. <laughs> those are great tips. And I try to follow some of that myself. Like when I take breaks from work, I like to walk outside and, you know, well, I work on this vineyard here in Napa Valley. And so I like to walk through the vineyard and occasionally I found myself, Oh, I should look at my phone. I should check what's up next. No, I'm going to leave that alone. You know, it's hard to do, but I try to do that. Yeah. And people that don't have access to nature and there are many people in urban environments that don't, um, even looking at nature photography um, has been shown to have some benefits as well. So, you know, eyes closed, you know, quiet music. The, these are the things that allow you to restore from cognitive fatigue, as opposed to just constantly staying in the loop of flooding your brain with information. Mm, that's, that's great tips. Thank you. And finally, um, one more question, please. Mm -hmm. uh, how can companies help their employees to focus, especially if they come back to work environment after uh, the pandemic and, and perhaps a year being off uh, working at home? Yeah, well, I think that the, the lessons that, you know, and the tips that we were just talking about should be coming from the top of an organization. Um, I don't, you know, based on the on research that we've done um, and others, the advice of multitasking to increase performance is not a good one. Um, it doesn't really in, in, in increase performance. It could degrade performance. It can increase stress. Really encouraging um, employees to focus on a single task at a time, it would be my recommendation. And encouraging breaks. Breaks are not a sign of weakness. I mean, if you look at the, the physical fitness equivalent of it, 
even athletes, you know, the highest level per physical performance um, individuals in the world understand the values of breaks to help restore and prevent injury. It's the same thing for your brain. You know, you want to make sure that you're constantly giving periods of restoration and recovery so that you can re-engage at the highest level. Uh, so I think all of that is really important to build into the workplace and, and, and they should be encouraged by uh, employers. I love that. And the ebb and flow of activity should be part of our daily lives as well as it is in nature. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Adam. It's been great talking with you today. Um, really enjoyed our conversation and I hope to talk to you again soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. He's an award-winning restaurateur and author whose latest book, Carry Out, Carry On, A Year in the Life of a Texas Chef, is about surviving the restaurant industry hardships brought on by the pandemic. Joining us now to talk about his lived experience with ADHD and how it's impacted his life, his creativity, and his career, Chef John Bunnell, welcome to Brainwaves. Thanks for being here. Hey, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Good to see you again. It's been, I think, about seven years since you prepared such a wonderful, delicious meal at our music festival for brain health in 2014, uh, was it? No, I think that's right. That was a lot of fun with Dwight Yoakam and the gang, yeah. Yeah, it was one, it's so great to, to meet you there and to have that time with you there. And your food is just amazing. I appreciate that very much. Absolutely. Um, and viewers, thank you for uh, watching as well. Uh, please don't forget, if you have any questions or comments, you feel free to post them in the comment section of this webcast at any time. So let's get started. Uh, John, you've had an incredibly sex successful career, actually multiple careers. Mm -hmm. You're born and raised in Fort Worth, Texas, and yeah. you're a graduate of Vanderbilt University and the New England Culinary Institute, which is pretty impressive. You've worked as a teacher before opening your first fine dining restaurant in 2001 to much popular acclaim. And then since then, you've written several books and your John, your Bunnell's restaurant group has expanded in the last 20 years uh, tremendously mm -hmm. to many accolades. So would you say the fast paced restaurant industry is an ideal location for somebody who experiences ADHD? You know, in, in some ways, it is perfectly suited for a brain like mine. I, I've got nine windows open at the same time, and that works. When I'm walking the dining room floor, I can talk to a table. I can hear who just walked in. The phone's going off. I know who's trying to call. The ticket printer's going, so I know this is happening. And all of that in my head just sounds perfect all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. You can, like, multitask, you know, uh, really easily. That's, that's pretty cool. Just kind of wired for it, I guess. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. Um, how did you first learn you had ADHD and how did that diagnosis first come about? You know, that's a great question. Um, I knew when I was a kid that I had some learning differences, learning disabilities, but my parents kind of wanted us to just not really worry about it. They said, my, my dad was very adamant. This was the seventies now. And he said, we are not putting medication to this kid. We're just gonna, you know, he's going through school and if he needs a tutor once in a while, we'll do it, but no, no medicine. When I was in college, I was an education major at Vanderbilt. Um, they had the number one education department in the nation. And one of our chapters we were studying was all about, back then we had ADD and ADHD. Now it's, it's, it's categorized differently. But when I started reading the chapter, oh my God, it was a story of my entire life. It seemed so incredibly obvious. I, I mean, I, I figured out that I had it real fast. So I looked up a doctor in Nashville and walked right in and said, here's the thing pretty sure I got ADD. Can you tell me if I do or not? And within about 30 minutes, he said, well, yes, you quite obviously do. What do you want to do about it? And uh, I did start on just old fashioned Ritalin. And I actually still take it once in a while uh, these days, but knowing what it was and reading a few books and kind of figuring out how I learn better, combination with taking medicine when I needed it, man, made a huge difference. That's wonderful. So you, it sounds like you managed it very successfully and, and take advantage of the strength that it brings you. Um, and that brings me to my next question. As you, as you pursued your goals, did you view your ADHD as a challenge to be overcome or as a strength to be harnessed? Man, that's a tough one because I've never known a brain any other way. It's kind of, this is what you got, so, so deal with it. Um, one of the things about ADHD people is that it's not that we can't focus. It's that we don't always get to choose what we focus on the most. And there's very often a huge component of hyper-focus. This is the annoying part when you get into something and it becomes a hobby and then it becomes an obsession and you can't stop. So once I started hyper-focusing on something that could be successful, like the restaurant industry and, and creating new dishes, 
and the wine list and the liquor program, all of these things, man, you obsess over that and suddenly you find out your restaurant career does well because of it. <laughs> That's fascinating, you know, that it, putting your all into the, the restaurant industry because you have that, that, that proclivity within your, your brain to do that. I mean, that has brought you so much success and, and, and brought so much happiness to so many people through the restaurants that you, that you uh, um, run. So uh, that's great to hear. Um, you know, before you embarked on a career as a chef, as you mentioned, you worked as a full, full-time math and science teacher. Yep. And why did you want to specialize in working with children who had ADHD? Um, did, did you, and what did your students teach you about the advantages of this type of neurodiversity? You know, once I figured out how my brain worked, I thought, man, I wish I had known this a long time ago. You know, medicine has just come so far. Studies have been done and we've just got a better grasp on the entire situation than we used to. So when I started looking for a teaching job, I really wanted to teach middle school and high school math and science. That was, you know, my, my field. And I found the Winston School in Dallas that specializes in learning differences. So many of the kids are either dyslexic or ADHD, different, different categories. And I said, look, if you got an ADD or ADHD kid, put them in my room for sure because I want Adam. I got, a, I got a way of, of showing them how I deal with certain stuff that I think will be you know, more helpful. It's, it's hard to understand another person's brain unless you got similar wiring. So anytime you know, you'd have the student sit there and say, well, I'm ADD, I just can't concentrate. And I'm like, no excuses, you're making us all look bad. Don't ever try that one. What else <laughs> you got? You know? I, I really love to, to kind of give them my specific ones. This was back before cell phones, iPhones, any of that stuff. So I had little tricks like if I needed to get something done before the end of the day, before I left school, for sure, write it on a post-it note. I could put it in my right pocket because my keys are there. Anytime I reach for my keys, there's a note. Hey, don't forget this one. Little stuff like that. No problem. Otherwise, I could forget to put my shoes on and walk out the door in the morning. I mean, little things like that. When you really found something important, the notes, all that kind of stuff, just training your brain making sure that you, you get the important stuff done. It's so cool that you're, you're mindful of, of your, um, like your strengths and your weaknesses and the things that you can, and ways to um, kind of take advantage of the strengths as well as uh, um, account for and, and, and correct for the weaknesses using the uh, techniques that you developed. So, um, sure. and I imagine you taught some of those to your students as well uh, on both ends of the spectrum. I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah. And uh, speaking of leaving your shoes behind, uh, I never saw you leave your shoes behind when you came to our vineyard. You had the <laughs> coolest tennis shoes or uh, running shoes that I really admired. <laughs> Thank you. You're probably always running around, you know, doing things with your restaurant business. Yeah. One of the things I, you know, hyper-focused on in my late 30s, suddenly realized that I was getting to be overweight and out of shape. And I said, you know, chefs don't have to be this way. And I picked up a running habit. And Typical with ADHD, I couldn't just run around the block a few times. I couldn't just go for a jog. I started competing in 5Ks. And then I thought, I wonder if I could do a half marathon. I wonder if I could do a triathlon. That sounds cool. And within you know, 10 years, I'm in Hawaii at the Ironman World Championship. <laughs> Hyper-focus all the way. That's, that's kind of how we do it. Once we're in, we're all in. <laughs> You're an amazing man, uh, John. Thank you. Um, so did you... Did, Working with your students teach you some of this hyper focus and how that can be a benefit, or what are some of the other things that your students taught you about the, the strengths of neurodiversity and ADHD? You know, when I saw it happening with other kids, I, I never understood what it was growing up myself. I just knew what my own brain was like on the inside. When I started seeing it in other kids, it became so much more obvious. And I thought, hey, when you start to hyper focus on something, it's not your fault. If it's if it's playing video games, it's not going to get you anywhere. I mean, I get it. Some kids make money on video games, but generally that's not much of a career. If it's car stereos, what if that became a career? What if you got so into it that could become something? Uh, the school where I was, they, they built a solar car. So the kids who were into it, that's all they would do. They're tinkering with solar panels and batteries. Find something that you hyper-focus on that you can't stop thinking about. And as long as it's going down the useful path, lean into it don't use it as a well you just can't think about it all the time hey if it's if it's useful absolutely lean into it make it all the time make it something that you love and it's something you can make a career out of i love that so, so passion is the key to focus amen Definitely. again our brain says 
not that you can't focus, but we don't get to choose which window is always flashing at us the most when you got five windows open. So focus is not intentional, but when you find one that grabs you, there you go. I, I couldn't focus on a history textbook no matter what. I can take the medicine, I can study it, and I can get through the test, but I'm never just going to be a history buff that just loves it. It's never going to grab my attention. But man, when food did, lucky for me, there's an entire industry based on food and wine and the alcohol service, all of it together, man, I leaned right into that one. So perfect. And uh, I, I can sympathize with the passion, the focus thing. Uh, I, I've been a guitar player for uh, several uh, years and not that I focus on that all the time, but when I do focus on it and start writing a song, which I did a few years ago, I just got so into that. I'd sit up like every night till like 11 o'clock, just writing lyrics and chords and things like that. Yeah. And, I just, it's that, I that love tickle in your brain that won't stop. Even when you're doing yeah. something else, it's still working on it. There you go. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. The music, music is very commonly part of that. Cool. Um, so what thoughts or words of advice do you have for companies who would like to support and support a nurture a neurodiverse workforce? And how can employers encourage their employees with ADHD to use their unique talents and skills to their advantage? And that's a, that's a great question. And if it's a big enough company where there's an HR department, somebody needs the right kind of training to recognize it and know what they're talking about. There's nothing worse than, you know, when a teacher just says, you know what, I want all these kids on medicine before I have them back. And they may not even be ADHD. If somebody is perfectly trained, they know what to spot, they know how to find out exactly where the strengths are, how they can help, that, that's all the difference in the world. Suggest the right books, the right podcast. Knowing what ADHD is was more important for me than actually being able to take the medicine. And trust me, the medicine does help when I need to pay the bills and I really don't want to. And I got to sit down and focus for four hours, pop a riddle and I'm good to go. Yeah. But the knowledge, the understanding, that is so much more important. Learning how you learn, learning how you perform better. So having the right HR training in a company is ideal. Fantastic. There's that. The proverb, know thyself uh, from the ancient Greek temple. And yep. uh, if, if HR professionals can help their employees to know themselves, um, then they can really accelerate how they can perform. I believe in that 100%. Cool. So from where did you draw the inspiration and necessary resilience to lead your restaurant business through the adversity of the pandemic as detailed in your book, <laughs> Carry Out, Carry On, You're in the Life of a Texas Chef? Oh man, that's a, that's a tough one because all of a sudden we got handed a, a new set of cards and, and they were tough. It happened fast and there were no leaders to look up to to say, hey, you've been through this before. How, how do we do this? Completely unprecedented. Nobody knew what to do. And, you know, I'm, I'm the kind that as soon as the adrenaline hits, that's when I start hyper-focusing again. And we spent a lot of time talking, saying, all right, what does the city need? What do we need? How are we going to be in business in a fine dining, full service restaurant when you can't open the door? This is a whole new set of circumstances we never even thought of. So we sat around for several hours and finally came to the conclusion, the only thing we can do is abandon our concept. We are not fine dining anymore. We need to feed the highest number of people for the lowest possible price we can do. This is family meal time for a bargain. We need to barely scrape by with a little bit of profit built in, but get as much food out the door as possible. And we changed to a curbside drive-through pickup service with all kinds of uh, extras. That way we could sell, not only do you get your family meal for the day, a, a four pack, but we could also sell our dry aged steaks, our fresh fish, everything we had in inventory that we needed to move before it just you know went bad on us. So that model ended up working very well. And I was completely, totally hyper-focused on the entire thing. All night I would wake up and think, you know what, the traffic flow is gonna be wrong. Let me think about getting some orange cones in the morning, write that down, make it a note on my iPhone. These iPhone has been the greatest tool for my kind of brain. Every time I think of something, I can make a note. I can do an audio. All right. Once I'm focused on something like, how are we going to get through this pandemic? Perfect. It keeps going. It's that tickle in your brain that, that doesn't quit. And once we got started and figured out our pattern, we we're able to convert our fine dining restaurants, both of them, into curbside family meal programs. And then eventually, once we were able to open again, shift back. That is brilliant how you pivoted and then committed and then saw through uh, the hats off to you for such success and for Thank sharing you. it. What words of advice do you have for other businesses as they try to recover from the, the adversities of the pandemic? 
Um, the only thing I can say is you can't get in the mindset of, I can't wait till it all goes back to normal. There's not going to be a back to normal. We have supply chain issues. We have labor problems. We have all kinds of new technology from QR codes to online ordering. All of that is here to stay for at least a while. So it's a whole new set of problems. It's a whole new set of equations. Work your way through them. If online ordering is what everybody's asking for, find the best software you can, get an online ordering system that absolutely works. If it, if it turns out no one's looking at your regular website anymore, maybe they're all on social media and that's where you focus to drive them to the website. The newer technologies, the way we've shifted, some of it's not going away. So time to make some changes if it's not working. You got to go with the flow and, and, and take advantage of what the flow is doing. Um, that, that's amazing. So thank you, John. Uh, you've been such a great source of inspiration and wisdom today and um, really appreciate all that you've shared with us. And, and viewers, thank you too. Before we leave you, we'd like to uh, present you with our team at One Mind Cyber Guide with some helpful information on this week's mental health app pick of the week. So take it away, Cyber Guide team. Hello, my name is John Bunny and I'm a digital mental health specialist at One Mind Cyber Guide. We spend lots of time talking to people about mental health apps, what they like about them and what they don't like about them. In our research, we've heard from lots of people that one barrier to using mental health apps are concerns about privacy and security. This is understandable as in some cases you might be entering sensitive private information about your well-being, which you don't want other people to see. Just like any other technology you use, you should only use apps you trust and are confident in their ability to protect your data. Any app you use should have a privacy policy that informs you about how the app handles your data. In a recent study, we found that over half of apps for depression don't have a privacy policy. You can check for a policy in the App Store at the bottom of the app page. If an app doesn't have a policy or you are unsure of the security of the app, avoid using it. At One Mind Cyber Guide, we review privacy policies to check if key pieces of information about what happens to your data are covered in the policy. We believe developers should be as transparent as possible about how they handle data, so you can make informed choices about the apps you use. Dailyo is an app made to help you track your mood. With each new entry, you record your mood, what activities you are doing, and other notes to go along with your entry. Various activities listed include reading, exercising, and gaming, but you can create custom activities of your own. You can also set reminders to help you consistently enter your mood throughout the day. Over time, you can view statistics and trends related to your mood and activities. You can also review your mood in a calendar view. In Dailyo, you can set goals for yourself to help strengthen a desirable habit or reduce undesirable ones. You can further personalize the app to your liking with various color options and various moods and emojis that you create. Upgrading to premium removes ads and unlocks features such as unlimited moods and goals and infinite reminders. We've reviewed Dailyo at One Mind Cyber Guide and it scores 3.67 out of 5 on our credibility scale and a 4.14 out of 5 on our user experience scale. You can learn more about Dailyo on our app guide at cyber.guide slash Dailyo. You can also find other resources for ADHD on the One Mind Cyber Guide website. This includes a guest blog by Micah Saviet where he highlights useful tools for those living with ADHD. Stay tuned next week for another app review. Thank you, CyberGuide team. Thank you so much to Chef John Bunnell, Dr. Adam Ghazali, and viewers, thank you as well. And don't forget, you can check out all of our past Brainwaves episodes at onemind.org slash brainwaves, where you can also sign up for our newsletter, our e-newsletter, and be alerted of any new Brainwaves episodes that come out. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Have a wonderful day. See you soon. Bye. Mental health is stepping out of the shadows and into the spotlight. I think I need help. Can you talk? Struggling. I'm here. I can't sleep. 
but we need the science and solutions to change lives. Now, more than ever, we are in this fight together. We are of one mind, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at onemind.org. Thank you.